Welcome to my discussion of Love Hina Part 3. Again, this refers to the TV series and nothing else, and again, this video is brought to you by spoilers. Wonderful, wonderful spoilers. And before I begin, there's something I'd like to address. In the preview for this at the end of Part 2, I said I was going to try to talk about some of the positive aspects of the show, but in Part 1, I said the show had no redeeming qualities, and I still stand by that. There is some good stuff here, but it's just not enough to redeem the show, and my hope is that over the course of these review segments, you'll understand why I say that. Anyway, let's get back to the review. Now, in my other videos, I've talked about the problems with some of the characters, and I realize that I've probably been a bit harsh on everyone, because when you think about it, there are actually two different versions of every character in the show. With Keitaro, the first version that we see is timid, awkward, and prone to injury. It's no accident that this is the version we see when he's interacting with the other main characters. Whenever he's away from these people, he actually becomes a pretty decent, normal guy, and on a few occasions, he really shines as a character. By the same token, I've spent a lot of time criticizing the main female characters for being irrational, violent, and not very likable overall. While it's worth noting that most of the abusive behavior comes from Naru and Motoko. And of course there's Kaola, who as I said before is mostly just trying to play, but this isn't exactly charming behavior. I mean, if a little kid kept trying to kick me in the head just for fun, I wouldn't think it was cute. I'd be pissed off. Oh, and halfway through the series, we're introduced to another character named Sarah McDougal. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not even going to get started here, save to say that she is quite literally a walking pile of demon spawn. The other characters are much more likable, or at least less aggravating, but they seem to get stuck in the background most of the time. Unfortunately, these two end up getting top billing a lot more often, and seriously, just yikes! It's like if you gave Super Saiyan powers to a bunch of toddlers. Or am I the only one who remembers the horribly unfunny Katie Kaboom segments from Animaniacs? Yeah, it's pretty much that times five. But again, this behavior only seems to surface when Keitaro is around. Otherwise, these characters mostly seem to get along just fine, just like Keitaro gets along fine when he's away from them. So again, I have to wonder, what was the point of the forced ending? Why does the show try so hard to convince us that Keitaro going back to the apartment to live with these people is the best thing that can happen? Not only is there no evidence to support this idea, but it's pretty much the exact opposite. And personally, I found that the only time that the show even approached being tolerable was when the characters split up so that it could focus on their individual backstories. Unfortunately, this reveals a much deeper problem with the show. The characters themselves aren't necessarily bad, they're just not good together. And if they can't figure out some way to get along over the course of the entire series, then they really, really need to not be together. But maybe you disagree. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, aren't you taking this way too seriously? The show's just supposed to be lighthearted and fun. But that's just it. It isn't fun. It's not fun watching a nice guy get beat up when he doesn't deserve it. It's not fun watching these characters just constantly being mad at each other. And I realize that in every part of this discussion so far, I've gone on some rant about the violence. And I do apologize if it's getting old, but that's the main running theme of the show. And it does get really old really fast. And I'm not the only one who feels that way. I've actually seen reviews from people who like the show defending it by saying, well, everyone hitting Keitaro gets tiresome, but hey, other harem shows always have the girls fall in love with the guy, so this is a good change. Um, no it isn't. Okay, okay. First of all, admitting that one of the show's main themes gets tiresome does not defend it. It still gets tiresome. I have to admit, I also thought it was interesting at first to have a harem show where the girls don't instantly fall in love with the guy. In fact, I actually appreciated that kind of approach. But as the show went on, I didn't care if any of them fell in love with them. I just wanted them to start getting along at some point, or at least treat the guy like a human being. The problem with the violence here is that it's overkill, and as I've said before, there's no context. It's like they literally wrote the script like, Okay, now Keitaro enters the room, so BAM! He gets hit through the wall! Uh, why? Well, uh, it's Keitaro. And he's there. No, no, we need some kind of a reason. Uh, oh, I know! He said good morning to Naru and she didn't like his tune! Good fucking lord, the Three Stooges made more sense than this. By the way, you know what else made more sense than this? Ranma One Half, which is also a comedy with some romantic elements, the lead female character is also a violent man-hating bitch, and the lead male character actually takes more of a beating than Keitaro. But I fucking love Ranma One Half, because it gets everything right. 
In the first place, the characters visibly get along better and care about each other more as the show goes along. And while Akane is very biased, she's not an idiot. She has real motivations for doing things, and the show actually helps the audience understand her point of view rather than just showing her becoming randomly pissed off at Ranma, which leads to Ranma himself. He's a big part of why the slapstick violence actually works here. He's a likable guy, but he can also be a pig-headed jerk a lot of times, so when the punches start flying, he usually deserves it. He's also a super strong martial arts fighter, almost as strong as Goku was at the beginning of the original Dragon Ball series. This means you can actually knock him around quite a bit without really having to worry too much about his well-being. And he also has a pretty fair chance at being able to defend himself. You're not just watching a guy cower for his life. With Keitaro, I just kind of felt sorry for him after a while. On a side note, there are a couple more tangentially related things that have been bothering me about Love Hina. First, aside from the rather confusing number of positive reviews for it, the relatively few people who seem to hate the show as much as I do tend to argue that it tries to emasculate men and that Keitaro is proof that nice guys are all losers. Now, I'm not sure what the show's message towards men is supposed to be, if anything, but as for the suggestion that nice guys are all losers, I wholeheartedly disagree. I love it when people are nice. I think that Keitaro shouldn't have been the lead character with the way he was portrayed, but oddly enough, Love Hina actually provides a good counterexample to this. In one episode, we're introduced to Kaolo's older brother, who isn't actually her brother, and who bears a striking resemblance to Keitaro. He's also strong and confident and charming and able to take charge in any situation. And he's also a nice person. That's the difference. Being nice does not mean that you have to let everyone walk all over you. And being in charge does not mean that you have to be an asshole. Getting back to this guy, though, it's also worth noting that he's a member of the royal family in whatever country Kaula happens to be from. And when we meet him, he's pretty much on the run, trying to avoid certain political responsibilities. Which makes me wonder, why wasn't the show about this guy? Oh, sure, in terms of character depth, he's just as shallow and disposable as anyone else in the cast, but wouldn't this have made the show more interesting by default? I don't know, I'm just saying. And another thing that's still kind of bothering me has to do with the box art. Now, throughout these videos, I've been using these pictures to illustrate the relationships between the characters. Well, if you didn't know, this is the artwork used for the original DVD covers. I'm actually kind of shocked at how honestly this conveys the tone of the show. You see, I didn't really notice the DVDs when they first came out. I picked up the series when the most recent, super affordable Thin Pack collection was released. Here, it seems to be selling itself entirely on fan service. And you know why this pisses me off? Because unlike the original DVD covers, everything about this is just the complete opposite of what these characters actually represent. It's kind of like Evangelion, where every single piece of promotional art shows Asuka as this smiling, happy, adorable little girl. And then you watch the show and find out that she's really the most joyless, bitter, angry cunt rag in the entire fucking universe. Seriously, as much as I bitch about the personalities and love Hina, none of these girls have anything on Asuka. But to get back on topic, I just don't like being sold on a group of happy, smiling characters to end up getting this instead. But anyway, that's about all I have to say about Love Hina. You know, I've watched a fair amount of anime. I've seen a lot of shows that I really liked, some that were disappointing, some that were boring, and others where I was clearly not the target audience. But this is the first anime that has just left me feeling pissed off. Am I missing something? I know a lot of people love it, but why? The running theme of the show gets boring, the story doesn't go anywhere, and the characters only work when you separate them from each other. Those aren't small issues to consider when you're talking about a hugely popular series with seemingly universal appeal. So now, it's your turn to tell me. Why do you like the show, and what, if anything, actually makes it good?